Hi, it's Mr. Anderson, and in this podcast, I'm going to talk about these guys, bacteria. Here's a couple of E. coli that are uh, undergoing binary fission. Uh, bacteria is an ancient domain. Uh, they're quite a bit different than us. We're in the domain Eukarya, uh, but they're just as fascinating. They've been around billions of years. Some of them are evil to us, and some of them are beneficial to us. And so if we look at their phylogeny, basically, if this is that last universal common ancestor, or LUCA, um, basically, they diverged from us a long time ago, and we have all these different types of bacteria. Know, that, know this, though, that there was a horizontal gene transfer as well. So mitochondria, chloroplast inside our cells, used to be bacteria of their own. And so they went like this and became part of our cells. And so there's a ton of this horizontal transfer. But basically, bacteria is going to be this other group, and they're going to be diverse and they fill all of these different niches on our, uh, on our planet. We're more related to archaea bacteria, and I'll talk more about that in the next podcast. Let's talk about the structure of them. First thing would be the size. Uh, imagine this right here. Uh, this bacteria on your computer screen is about this big. Then eukaryotic cells are going to be about the size of you. So we're like 10 times bigger than a prokaryotic cell or a bacterial cell. Um, a few other things that are different. Well, our DNA is going to be organized in chromosomes, which are linear stretches, and they're going to be inside a nucleus. And so inside a bacteria, they have what's called a nucleoid region. So all their genetic information is going to be in here in this wadded up lo uh, center location inside the bacteria. But they'll also have extra bits of DNA, and those are going to be found in these structures called plasmids. Um, their genetic material, instead of being in a line, is actually going to be in a loop. And so they're going to have a loop of DNA. Um, another thing they don't have are going to be introns. In other words, every little, pit, uh, every little bit of this DNA is going to code for genes or is going to have a function. And then they're going to have these plasmids, which are little extra bits of DNA. Um, but the whole thing is wound up so it fits inside the bacteria. Another thing that they're going to have is... Um, let me kind of jump ahead as we move out is going to be the cell wall. And so if we go here, all cells, of course, are going to have cytoplasm or cytosol and they're going to have ribosomes. However, bacteria ribosomes look a little different than ours. But if we move our way out, they're going to have a plasma membrane. So they're going to have a lipid bilayer. But outside of that, they're going to have a cell wall. And so bacteria are going to have a cell wall. And that cell wall is going to be made up of a chemical called peptidoglycan. Peptidoglycan is a polysaccharide, but it's going to have all of these cross links between it. And so it's a really stable structure. It's going to be different than the cell wall that we'd find in plants and different from the cell wall that we'd find in fungi. And remember, we don't have a cell wall. Now, luckily, we can target this. So a lot of antibiotics, like penicillin, for example, is going to punch holes in that peptidoglycan in the cell wall. It's going to lyse the cell. And we can take a whole bunch of penicillin, as long as we're not allergic to it, and it's not going to impact us because we don't have that cell wall. Okay, so they got a cell wall. And then as we move our way out, the next thing is going to be a capsule. A capsule is going to be like polysaccharide, so it's going to be this jelly-like material. And then lots of times you'll have pili that'll move outside of that, and so these little appendages on it. Now, we can get some movement in a bacteria from these pili, but most of that movement in a bacteria is just going to come from a flagella, which is just going to move around and allow that bacteria to move. Again, they're really, really small, and these are really, really microscopic. But the pili are going to allow them to grab on to material, and then this capsule is going to allow them, for example, to start forming a biofilm. Another thing about the pili is that that's going to be where those antibodies grab on. And so as the pili change, then we're not going to be immune uh, to that. We're not going to make those uh, the antibodies for that specific type of bacteria. So these are the structures of uh, a, a bacteria that's shared by all bacteria, but they have a ton of different shapes or a ton of different morphologies. And so a lot of them are going to be this spherical shape. We call that cocci. Um, a lot of them are going to be this bacilli shape. So E. coli being an example of this, or like strep throat is going to be a bacteria. Strepto means strings of uh, cocci or the spherical shape. Staphylococci, you maybe heard of like staph food poisoning. So that's going to be their morphology that they have. But some are going to be spirals, some are going to be vibrio shapes, some are going to be these spirochetes. So there's a whole bunch of different shapes, and we'll classify according to that shape. Uh, and then the other way that we can classify them is using what's called a gram stain. So gram stain is going to use chemicals to stain the bacteria because they don't really show up under a microscope unless we stain them. But there are basically two types of bacteria, what are called gram negative. And what they'll have is a plasma membrane. So they're going to have a membrane. Then they're going to have that layer of peptidoglycan, that cell wall. And then they're going to have another membrane on the outside. 
And so when they stain it, they're not going to stain as brightly, and so we're going to call those gram-negative. These are some of the nastier types of bacteria because it's hard for us to get to that uh, peptidoglycan layer. And then we're going to have gram-positive, so they're both basically going to have this lipid bilayer, and then they're going to have the peptidoglycan on the outside, and so you can see they're going to be much darker in color. And so you can classify bacteria by calling it like a gram-positive staphylococci. But there's going to be hundreds of different varieties of that, and each of those are going to have different metabolism. And so what do they eat? How do they make a living? Well, they pretty much do it in every way possible. And so there are three different types of nutritional types, what do we call our phototrophs. You can think of that. It's light eaters. Lithotrophs, so that's going to be like earth eaters, and then organotrophs, so like living eaters or the eaters of life. And so basically there's two ways that we can classify them. First one is going to be where do they get their energy? So they could get it from sunlight, inorganic compounds, so that's going to be just chemicals or organic compounds, and then where they get their carbon from. So it'd be important to kind of mention where we are. So we are going to be what's called a chemoheterotroph. And so we're going to get our energy from the food that we eat or organic compounds. And then we're going to get our carbon from organic compounds as well. So we're what's called the chemoheterotrophs. But there are going to be a whole different variety of lives that uh, bacteria can live. In other words, some of them will get their uh, source of energy from inorganic compounds, and then they'll fix carbon out of the atmosphere. We call those lithoautotrophs. And so what are the two major groups? Because you're going to have bacteria in all six of these groups. Well, we would have the photoautotrophs. An example of that in eukaryotic cells would be like plants. Uh, but in bacteria, it's going to be algae, like these blue-green algae. So they're getting energy from the sun, and then they're getting their carbon from the atmosphere. Uh, or chemoheterotrophs are going to be like us. And so most bacteria are going to be of that type. So like E. coli, they're eating their food, and then they're doing cellular respiration and getting the carbon from that food. So how do they reproduce? Well, they don't do mitosis or meiosis. What they do is they reproduce through a process called binary fission. So basically what they'll do is they'll copy that nucleoid region, and then it simply splits in half and so we'll get two and those two split in half and and it just keeps splitting in half and so basically what you get are a bunch of bacteria and all of those bacteria are going to be identical to that first bacteria and so that's going to be really quick sometimes it's as fast as like 20 minutes for them to just make a reproduction so you can make them really quick really really fast However, they're all genetically identical to that first bacteria as long as we don't have mutations. And so you might think, well, that makes them easy targets as far as natural selection goes. But then they have these elements that they can swap between each other. So they can let go of DNA and that can be either released into the atmosphere and picked up by another bacteria. They have these plasmids that they can release and can transform other bacteria. Bacteria can come together and transfer plasmids between them. There can be viruses that, that uh, release the take the DNA from one bacteria and, and, and bring it to another. And so these are all forms of, I would call, uh, biological sex. In other words, ways that we can create new bacteria without doing the steps of mitosis, excuse me, of meiosis and all of that crossing over. So example, let's say that you take, uh, let's say you have tuberculosis and you start taking antibiotics, but you don't take all of the antibiotics. Well, you're going to kill all the bacteria that are um, susceptible to antibiotics, but you're going to leave those behind that have some resistance. And a lot of that resistance will be found in these plasmids. Well, now the bacteria that are left can actually transfer those, back, those plasmids to another bacteria, giving them resistance, and so then they can grow. And so it's a really quick way that, for them to get a huge amount of variability. Um, there's actually three ways they transfer that. Transformation is picking up something loose in the environment. We have conjugation. It's the closest to actual sex where pillows will attach between two and they can share genetic information. And then the last one's going to be transduction, when a virus infects one and then infects another. So um, we used to think they were fairly simple, that bacteria just live this kind of a lonely life, or we call that a planktonic life. And so a great study was done in the 1980s on Vibrio fisheri, which is a type of bacteria that when it's alone in the ocean by itself, it doesn't make any kind of a color. But if you get it living together in a colony, if there's a bunch of them close to each other, then they can start to glow. So it's like they were talking to each other. And in fact, the bobtail squid uses these Vibrio fisheri inside it to illuminate. 
And so, especially these eye pouches right here. And so scientists finally figured out how they communicate, and they communicate through a process called quorum sensing. So basically, a bacteria is going to give off chemicals, and we call those autoinducers. Some of them will be picked up by bacteria of the same species, but some of them are going to be given off, and they're going to be picked up by all bacteria in an area. And so if you're just by yourself, nobody's going to hear that message. But if there's more bacteria and more bacteria, Eventually, there are going to be so many autoinducers that those are going to trigger genes to be released. And so in this case, it would trigger a luciferase gene, which would make all of them glow. And so basically, bacteria are working together, communicating with each other to say how crowded it is, or maybe to uh, start increasing virulence so they can actually start promoting a disease. Um, and so this is a great area of, of research that we're going on to as far as uh, stopping bacterial growth. Because we've figured out if you just treat them with antibiotics, they quickly evolve around that. And so if we could somehow target the communication, that would be another great way that we could kind of stop bacteria, at least the evil ones. And so that's domain bacteria, incredibly important, incredibly complex. We seem to learn something new every day. And I hope that's helpful.